everybody and welcome to the latest Genome Giants interview. Today we are joined by scientist, educator and podcast host Janina Jeff. So before we get and delve into your career, Janina, if you could just introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about what you do as well. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Janina Jeff. I am a population geneticist and I am formerly a staff scientist at Illumina as well as a host and creator of a podcast called In Those Genes. And In Those Genes is a podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost histories and futures of African descendants. And more recently, we've been also covering basic science journalism like COVID-19. So if we just go back to the beginning, um, you grew up in New Orleans. What are some of your kind of fondest memories from growing up? Yeah, so, um, huh. I would say growing up with like a large family of people. I have, my grandparents have lots of siblings. And so I have a lot of great aunts, a lot of great uncles, and then their children, so cousins and, and so forth. So I grew up in a really big community of people who loved and cared about me, which is amazing. So with that comes so much diversity and the type of people that I was close to, um, family members, friends, and in school specifically, one of my fondest memories, and I talk about this a lot, is, you know, when I was in elementary school and your grandparents ask you questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And that question should like be abandoned, like it should, it should be abolished from all type of like for children in general, but definitely for young adults, like we should just stop asking that question. Um, but back then when we asked that question, I remember my grandfather dropping me off at school and I told him that I wanted to be a mathematician. And my main reason and only reason was because I was good at math and like math makes so much sense. It was like, okay, I'm gonna be a mathematician. It makes so much sense. And, um, and then, when I was in school, I started doing science fairs and I'm a very competitive person, mostly with myself, which I mean, I don't know what scientist isn't. And I was like winning these science fairs, but also being able to tap into my creativity. And so if you ever been to New Orleans, hear about New Orleans, New Orleans is a city of creatives, right? You have musicians, you have artists, you have um, the culinary industry, um, you have so much. And I think science and STEM was less talked about, but competing in these career fairs was like an opportunity for me to express that creativity uh, in a different way. Apart from being kind of creative, what, what else were you like it as a child? And how did you go from kind of like liking that maths kind of subject to then going over more to other types of sciences? Yeah, so as a child, I was very inquisitive. Um, my parents tell the story. I was very inquisitive and always, um, it's interesting how I had a sense of human rights. Like, obviously, this was before I knew I was Black, you know, this is before I knew, you know, what it meant to be a woman. And uh, my parents tell stories of like when people, we were, at a, we were at a restaurant and something like that. And I asked the waitress for chicken nuggets. And she was like, we are out of chicken nuggets. And I was like two or three. And I was like, this is just ridiculous. <laughs> and <laughs> ridiculous is such a big word for a two or three year old, you know? Um, especially in the 80s. And so I was always a child that was like yearning and asking for more and was always, you know, knew that the world had more to offer and felt confident and bold enough to ask the world for more. And so that's just an example of how I, I was then. Um, in terms of like shifting to shifting sciences. So in New Orleans, I went to New Orleans I mean, I lived in New Orleans until I was 17. And so in high school, I hadn't quite gotten a handle on what type of science that I was gonna be interested in yet. You know, it wasn't until I went on to college uh, where I started to explore different types of sciences more and, and then specifically genetics. So when I was at Spelman, uh, which is where I went for undergrad, I uh, worked in a genetics lab and it was uh, what we call a damp lab where you do some bench work um, and you also kind of go on the computer and do some computational work. And the computational work then was, you know, blasting sequence data on UCSD genome browser. And that was like, the that was bioinformatics, you know, big time then. Um, 
And so that was kind of when I started to get interested in genetics. And at that time I was working in a bovine um, genetics lab uh, and I really enjoyed it. So that was my, that was my introduction into genetics. And how do you feel like your kind of upbringing um, kind of affected your career decisions and made you kind of want to go into to, to this area? And did you have kind of, kind of any role models who like growing up that kind of encouraged you to go into this area as well? I didn't have role models that directly encouraged me to be in science um, per se. I don't have, I have an uncle who has a PhD um, in um, computational science. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the exact word. What do they call it? Um, computer science. No. <laughs> so he has a PhD in computer science from Georgia Tech. And then, um, but I would say the person who was probably most instrumental in me knowing very early on that I was going to continue on with a doctorate degree, even before I had started college, would be my grandfather. And so uh, my grandfather uh, was a psychologist. He has a PhD in sociology. And he, you know, really was a civil rights activist. And so even when I was younger, all of the things that I'm able to do now, he was doing, you know, he had gotten his PhD, he had been working on books, he had, you know, um, been teaching courses, he had also been, you know, leading a, a therapeutic service, he also was the president of an organization called 100 Black Men, he had been on Oprah even back in the 90s. And so, you know, I uh, was very fortunate to grow up very close to my grandfather. And he was the one who, you know, I told him I was going to be a mathematician. And at that time, that the PhD was in math, right? Um, and, but he definitely continued to push me along and continue to reemphasize the importance of my identity, uh, the importance of family. And so while my grandfather wasn't a formal geneticist, you know, he was definitely deep into genealogy and deep into thinking about our connections with our ancestors. And at that time, I would say, you know, that upbringing and a lot of my family's very Afrocentric. So a lot of my childhood was about learning about my ancestors, learning about the people who came before me. I wasn't quite making that connection to genetics yet, but I definitely think it built the foundation of my interest in it because you know, living in America as a Black person, you don't have access to the history of your ancestors. Um, it's intentionally kept away from you. So to be in a family where we were, you know, very progressive and very, very conscious about how do we reclaim and re-identify ourselves um, and how do we change this negative story to a story that we can learn from and benefit from. And so my grandfather always talked to me about the Sankofa principle, which is a Ghanaian principle that basically um, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, the principle means to go back and fetch, you know, and that means to go back and fetch, you know, the things that came before you and to use those things to fuel what is coming ahead of you. And um, if you ever seen the Sankofa symbol, it's a picture of a bird whose head is turned backwards and its mouth is on an egg, you know? So it's just this idea of that in order to fully understand ourselves, we have to understand who we are, where we come from, and then use that information to fuel our futures, you know? So I, I'm really big into like futures, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> You mentioned that you got your bachelor's degree at Spelman um, College. What was your What was your time um, like here? I had a great time. It was a great, amazing time. <laughs> college is fun. Um, <laughs> so Spelman College is a historically black college. Um, it was started in 1881, and um, Spelman has a long-standing history. And so I'm actually named after a series of women in my family. We all have the same initials, JMJ. My great aunt is Jolaine Maria Jeff, then her niece is Jolena Maria Jeff, and then her other niece is Janine Maria Jeff, and then I'm Janina Maria Jeff. And so I uh, was the second generation to attend Spelman and following the footsteps of my aunt, who I've been following, you know, pretty much my whole life. And 
you know, I, my grandfather passed away the summer before I went to Spelman. And one of the things that he told me before I passed away, you know, I was applying for college and I had gotten into Spelman and he actually wrote out my deposit check. I had no idea how I was going to pay for Spelman. He wrote out my deposit check and he told me, you know, to be the woman that I needed to be, I needed to attend Spelman College. And then he passed away June before I went to Spelman. And um, so I knew that Spelman was the place where I was supposed to be. Like I knew this is where I'm supposed to be. And so um, I walked into Spelman with that in mind. And when I got there, I built, which I think every Spelman woman build is a community of black women who are like-minded who support each other who are you know Spelman at that time probably was accepting about five to six percent of the applicants and so you're getting the top tier you know people who have 20 million extracurricular activities who also have a 4.3 gpa who also are well-rounded who also are so conscious about the world all coming together at one time you know like it's not coincidence that so many of us go on to do great things after spellman but the biggest thing that happened at spellman was the development of a sisterhood and so you know i think community is something that re-emphasizes itself in every phase of my life and at spellman that community was building a sisterhood with my spellman sisters who are now you know, my best friends to this day, and they're all doing great and amazing things. And we all support each other in great and amazing ways. And so that would be the biggest thing I got from Spelman. From a science perspective, in addition to getting a great education and working in a genetics lab and really being introduced into research, one of the things that I think is unique about the Spelman experience is that because Spelman is really focused on womanhood and reinforcing the value of being a woman and kind of reinstilling the power that women have and, the, and, and also how that came to be, because this is not how it always started, right? And this is how it should be. I go back and look at some of my early books um, at Spelman. We had to take a class called African Diaspora in the World. And a lot of men at our brother's school, Morehouse, joke and say like, this is the womanish training, right? Like, this is like womanish boot camp. You go through this class and you're like, yes, I'm a womanist and here are all the great thing, amazing things about women. And I was rereading the book last year and just thinking, just reading it and like, wow, I had no idea at 18 what I was reading and how far ahead of time Spellman was. We were talking about, you know, gender not being a thing then. We were talking about race not being a thing then. We were talking about how the patriarchy has shaped and the intersection of being woman and being Black then and how that experience kind of cultivates and, and creates this unique, you know, group of women. And so... Um, from a science perspective, the thing that has, you know, Spelman has done is Spelman made sure that no matter what discipline you were in, you learned and you were confident enough to tap into kind of like the soft skills as well. Make sure that you learn how to network, make sure that you know how to talk, make sure that you can communicate. Um, because we have all of this knowledge and, and by no means is it saying, or am I saying that it's everyone's duty or um, job to communicate, because there's a very fine line there. But if you want to communicate yourself and you want to connect with people, here's a way in which you do it. And so at Spelman, I feel like I really got the experience of learning how to communicate and be confident in what I'm communicating. And as a scientist, that's a very unique skill set because most of scientists you know, we like to work in silos, you know, we like to work on that little thing that we're working on. We don't really care if no one else understands it as long as our reviewers understand it. That's all that matters. <laughs> and so um, I value that part, getting the soft skills that I needed to get. Now, the part, and this kind of transitions into Vanderbilt that I didn't realize is I was in this like very sacred, you know, safe space of women who look like me, women who supported me, women um, who were just so pro each other and then going to Vanderbilt where then I was the only person who looks like me. Um, and that was a, that was a completely different transition, but Spellman definitely like helped build the social and, um, soft skills in addition to the science that I needed. Yeah. It sounds like you kind of learn kind of essentially life skills that I think are often lacking from 
like school and, and, and university and things like that, because especially like the communication part, because I feel like a lot of scientists, they get the education in terms of the science, but then they leave and then they're like, oh, I can't interact with people. I can't, I can't speak to people. And so I feel like that is, is like a really, really important part. But as you kind of mentioned, um, you then went on to do your, your doctorate um, at Vanderbilt University. What was that transition like for you? And how did you kind of deal with that I suppose like kind of culture shock and going to this completely different university it was hard <laughs> it was very hard <laughs> um so you know I, I grew up in New Orleans predominantly black city at that time um Atlanta another predominantly black city at a predominantly black school um I had never I, you know in elementary school I went to a more diverse school but I hadn't really been exposed or being the only one that was kind of like a culture shock. I expected it. Um, I even expected what that experience could be like because, you know, obviously there are other Black women who came before me, even other Black women from Spelman who went on to do PhDs at Vanderbilt who, you know, could prepare me for what to expect. But then I think I definitely didn't um, understand the subtle things that were affecting me and kind of chipping away. And I would say the biggest thing is having imposter syndrome. If you can imagine, if you walk into any room and you're the only one, right? If you walk into any room and let's say you guys are all getting together to talk about, you know, one topic, but you're the only woman there, you look around and you ask yourself, well, why am I here, right? And do I deserve to be here? Because there should be more women here at this table. Um, there should be more Black people here at this table. And so I already walked in feeling very alienated because I was different. And of course, when you walk into this, if you are the different one, um, people ask questions, you know, people make assumptions. And, you know, in my experience, I expected that I was used to it. Now that I'm older, I didn't realize how it was having an effect on me, how it was affecting me, how you know, my own issues of insecurities were coming out because of this experience, how my own issues of anti-Blackness were coming out because of this experience, um, my own issues with patriarchy. And we all deal with these systems in different ways, even if we are part of an oppressed group. And I think at that time, you're so used to dealing with them, you don't understand the psychological toll it can take on you. And so it was then when I realized, oh, there's this thing called anxiety, right? Like, oh, I didn't know, you know, you hear about anxiety, but there weren't people in my community talking about, oh, I have anxiety, so I can't go to work. We didn't have a choice. You know, you, you went to work because you had to go to work and you just put together, you put all those things that you're dealing with on the side and you push through it. And so that was my Vanderbilt experience. I was pushing all these things on the side and just pushing through and just pushing through and just pushing through. And so I definitely had some challenges when I was at Vanderbilt, you know, um, one of which being the qualifying exams, which are oral exams, which if you want to test your anxiety, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great way to do it. To have to talk about all the things that you've been learning and what you've been studying. It's a very, very, um, you know, nerve wracking process. And in my first time taking the qualifying exam, you know, I didn't pass it. And I think that was largely because I was just nervous. I was nervous, I was anxious, and I was dealing with all this self-doubt. I already felt that I was, you know, not as smart as everyone else. That's my own anti-Blackness kicking in, right? Like, why would I, I had no basis of thinking that. I went through the same application process as everyone else. Um, and so, you know, I didn't pass the exam. You know, I went to therapy for uh, the second time in my life. and and started to realize that I was dealing with a lot of insecurities and a lot of self-doubt and just started to learn how to manage that. I mean, I'm still working on that, you know? Like I, I tell people, spoiler alert, it doesn't go away. You know, you continue to deal with imposter syndrome in different areas and walks of life. And I would say, you know, it's not even something that's unique to women, men deal with it too. We've just been socialized to express it in different ways. and. Now, just learning that, learning how to manage that and just kind of reinstilling and reminding myself what's reality versus what am I, you know, cultivating in my head that's creating this painful experience. What would you kind of say or what would the advice that, that you would give to people who are experiencing that? Because it is something that's kind of really horrible. And I think often like, I felt it at, at university and like I feel like afterwards you kind of look back and you're like, why? 
why did I like accept that? Like, why did I allow myself to, to kind of think like that, if that makes sense? So what advice would you kind of give to, to someone who's experiencing that? My biggest piece of advice would be, um, so the first thing is like, the first step is always realizing it. I didn't realize it, you know? Um, going to therapy, I had begun to realize it. Then you go to therapy and you talk about it and like, oh my God, now what do I do about it? And your therapist is like, you just talk about it. I'm like, ah, I feel like I need a little bit more. I'm tired of talking about it. <laughs> um, but that really is true. I mean, talking about it and talking through it, what has been for me, talking through what is really real versus what am I creating? And then starting to ask yourself, well, why am I creating this environment that is obviously painful for me? So I'll use myself as an example. What I was seeing, I'm at Vanderbilt. I'm one of the only ones. I'm like, oh my God, they're all going to think I'm stupid. They're all going to realize that I don't know what I'm talking about and that I'm stupid and that oh, all their assumptions about Black women up until this point were exactly right, right? The reality is, as I lived in a world for my entire life where those assumptions and um, those assumptions about Black people and the uh, success of Black people, particularly in the sciences, I already walked in with that predisposition and so did they so did so did the people in my program right but I also went through the same application process I also went through the same coursework that they went through I'm also going through the same rigorous processes that everyone else is going through and I'm excelling through these processes so why do I think that I'm less than the reality is, is I'm doing the same exact thing as everyone else now I am dealing with other issues that kind of you know are about my identity and and the way that I experience my identity in this world that maybe other students aren't dealing with, right? And maybe that's what's causing the anxiety. Maybe that's what's causing the imposter syndrome. But the reality is I am here. I am excelling. I am doing all the same things as my counterparts. So let me quiet these loud voices and the noise of the world. And let me focus on what's actually in front of me. I mean, you, you were the first African-American to get a PhD in human genetics at, at Vanderbilt. How did that kind of feel at the time? And now upon reflection, how does that feel today as well? It's really interesting. So at the time, I never really said it much. I knew it was, I was asking around and it, it was something that no one else had thought about, but it was on my mind, right? Um, and there were other students who trained with PhD professors who weren't Vanderbilt students in genetics. And so I started to kind of even discredit it. Like, well, I'm not the first because there's other students here, but they weren't, were, not, were not Vanderbilt students. They weren't trained at Vanderbilt. So technically, no, they, they aren't Vanderbilt students. So I even started to like invalidate this huge accomplishment that was clearly there. And then other students would too, you know? I remember saying it to a few grad students and they were trying to, to justify it or, you know, say, oh, but other first, you know, other people here trained and we have other black people who are doing other things here, you know, um, and it wasn't until much, much later that I started to say, no, actually, this is a fact. <laughs> I am the first black person, like, I mean, it's just a fact. I am the first black person to graduate with a PhD in human genetics from Vanderbilt. And I should be proud of that. I can't take on everyone else's guilt about that. Why can't I be proud about it? Why does that, why should that make anyone feel uncomfortable? And it shouldn't, right? Because the good news is I'm not the last. <laughs> and never did I think I would be the last. No, it's such a great achievement. And I feel like that kind of that like as a, as a role model for like other people coming through. And as you said, like you won't be the last. And, you kind of started that that chain off and I think it's a great accomplishment <laughs> thank you so, I mean after obviously you, you did your PhD what was your kind of early career like and, and kind of going from there how did you kind of navigate through this this community I mean it's crazy <laughs> yeah so I had an amazing PhD advisor um, her name is Dr. Dana Crawford and she is a genetic epidemiologist and so at the time to give like a little bit of genetic uh, timeline, I was working on GWAS. We were doing some of the first GWAS. And I don't know if you've ever seen or heard about Manhattan plots, these GWAS Manhattan plots. We were working on the ones that were like hideous. 
They were so hideous. Um, I think we used to, I'm trying to think if we made the plot itself in a program named Stata, I think it was, we made these plots. Oh, it was another program. It was like an LD. I can't think of the name of the program. We would make the first Manhattan plot. And just to give you a time frame of how like archaic this was to plot 500,000 SNPs or even 300,000 SNPs, which was considered GWAS. That's like, like that was huge then, right? And a hundred and a couple hundred people. It would take like 30 minutes to plot that, you know? Like it would just show up, like just die. But it was just funny. Um, but my early research was focused on cardiovascular disease and specifically quantitative traits that are associated with cardiovascular disease. And so you can consider a cardio, these traits as like an intermediate phenotype. And so, you know, saying someone has um, chronic heart failure or uh, congestive heart disease, that's an end phenotype where now we have diagnosed the patient with this, we know the clinical progression and outcome of this given disease. Um, what I was studying were quantitative traits that lead up to it. And so specifically um, arrhythmias in the heart and how we measure um, cardiac arrhythmias in different different time points um, in a heartbeat. And so I was studying the genetics behind that. And my, um, my advisor was interested in genetic epidemiology. And so we were a, big, a part of a big, large cohort and everyone was studying all kinds of things. And so my very, 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 very first paper, I think it was published in 2011 or 2010. And it is on, um, it is on, what was then my favorite gene. Every every person has their favorite gene when they're like in grad school because no one else cares about your gene but you. And it was a sodium channel gene called SCN5A. And a lot of research had been done on it in the past, but I was like, you know, kind of tapping into the beginning of really how we started to take all these research that was being done in European descent populations and trying to understand what does it look like in other populations. And that's a huge part of epidemiology and so I was doing uh, that research. SCN5A was one of my favorite genes. I also studied other quantitative traits um, associated with cardiovascular disease, like clotting factors, um, and all, the, all of the mini metrics that are captured um, in a blood draw um, that we call a CVC, and just looking at the genetics of those traits. And so I was doing this and uh, you know, trying to replicate findings in European descent populations but also looking at the extent in which those findings, um, you know, held up in African descent and indigenous American and Latinx, well, I should say Latinx uh, populations, not indigenous American, but Latinx populations. And so that was a lot of my PhD work. Um, and then towards the end of my PhD, I really started to try to understand, well, we are not able to replicate the findings of European descent individuals, let's answer the question why, right? And to answer that question, we have to do a deep understanding of populations in general. We have to do a deep understanding of the history of populations and what I like, what we call the genetic architecture of a given population. And so I then, um, you know, was really diving deep into population genetics. And so that was when I was kind of like, okay, I think it's time for me to evolve out of this lab and go a little bit deeper into the populations themselves and understanding what are the different parts of the genome that we can characterize and, and, and quantify and qualify and quantify that are unique, these population signatures that are unique to populations who share common ancestors. And so that was when that was kind of taken off into my postdoctoral research. Why is population genetics kind of so important? And what are some of the kind of existing challenges within this kind of area as well? Population genetics is extremely important. Um, one of the reasons why I like to think of it is when we think about diseases and phenotypes that are manifesting in present day, a lot of them could be attributed to you know, natural selection. A lot of them could be attributed to how our bodies are evolving with the environment. In order to understand that, we have to understand the ancestors that came before us and the types of environments they were living in. And a really great example of that is sickle cell and malaria, where you know having having the, the variant that yields for sickle cell disease um, prevents you from developing malaria. And that's definitely you know in our ancestors' time was something that saved lives, right? 
like your body was having to choose, well, do you need to live, you know, to 40 versus, you know, dying at five or six? Well, we're going to select for you to live, you know, until 40 or so. Now, the thing is, is, you know, we have migration, forced migration by way of slavery, and also, you know, intentional migration of other populations and natural migration that's just happened in human history. And so once our environments start to change, depending on how fast that comes, you know, our bodies may not be caught up to speed with our new environment and, and most importantly, technology. And so now you have, you know, now sickle cell is a big, big, you know, issue, right? People are, are malaria is not as much of um, a threat as sickle cell has been, particularly living in um, the Western world. Um, as you, I'm not sure if you heard a couple of days ago, it was announced by the World Health Organization that we now have um, a treatment for malaria, which is really, really exciting. Um, and also now you're starting to see a lot of gene editing technology being used to help and cure sickle cell. And so there's a lot of advancement that technology is now kind of coming in and saying, let's, you know, let's now try to fix things that our bodies won't be able to, you know, fix on their own naturally in the time period that we're here. When we talk about evolution, we talk about natural selection, these things happen very, very, very slow, right? So it's not like you can move and like, oh, 400 years later, our body should be used to this environment. These things happen thousands of years, right? Like thousands of years is even considered fast. Like, you know, a lot of things are like millions of years, you know? So, um, you know, understanding population history directly informs and can tell us a lot about what we're seeing in health disparities. And, you know, genetics is just one part of it. Population, you know, history as a whole is also important. Culture is important, right? Um, our environments are important. The engagement of culture, environment, and genetics is all important. And so we have to understand all of that stuff to really be able to answer the full question of like, what's really going on. So um, there are several challenges. One, we're talking about now in the last, let's say, let's be generous and say seven to 10 years that geneticists are starting to say, oh yeah, we should probably study other populations. Mostly because if we understand more populations, then we can start to create develop cures, right? Um, we can start to understand how a medical practice that has been researched, discovered, and um, used in only one population, it's clearly not benefiting other populations. Other people are dying. We have to study other populations in order to save those lives. But also in doing that, we learn so much information that we actually wind up creating more information to save everyone. And so it's a, it's a really great thing. Um, but that challenge being, because there's such a long history of only studying European descent populations, there are so many limitations. One is that the discovery that we're seeing, we can't really say it's a true, true discovery, right? Because a lot of times that we see these um, discoveries that we find, if they don't translate to other populations, that could mean a lot of different things. It could mean that the variant that we thought was causing the disease is actually not causing the disease, right? Maybe it's not causing the disease the way the genome works. Maybe it's hanging out with other variants that actually cause the disease and it's just the skies. And we can only see it in one population. When we study other populations, we can really hone in and say, oh, actually it wasn't that variant, even though it, it looks like that variant, it's this one. And this is the one we should maybe look after to think about a drug target. Um, so that's one of the challenges is that everything that we've known beforehand all has to be, you know, restudied in other populations with a critical lens. And the other thing is that how do we do that, right? So at Illumina, we create the technology to do this. And before next generation sequencing, a lot of that technology was on genotype and arrays, which is very limited, um, very selective, you know? And so you have to know what you want to um, assay before you actually, you know, before you actually do it. And so the problem is, is that if all of your research up until that point are all in European descent populations, the technology also is geared towards European descent populations. So even though you're asking the question in African descent populations, you don't even have enough information to do it because the technology is not really supporting this population. And that's what I work on at Illumina. And we've been really successful in the last, you know, five or six years 
or maybe seven years even with improving that technology and really making that technology as inclusive as possible from a genomic perspective. Um, you know, and then the other part is we talked about, you know, discovery practice and what we're studying and making sure discoveries are real and that they apply to different populations. In order to do that, we need the technology to do that. In addition to the technology to do that, we also need the methods. So we know human genetics is a really large computational field, right? When we think about statistics, the statistics have to also match all of this stuff. So like the methods that we create have to be, you know, have to understand that there's underlying population structure differences between different groups of people so that when we actually get an association, we can say, this is real. So we have, you know, the discoveries, we have the technology, now we have the methods that have to be improved. And then the other biggest challenge is that we have to make sure we have the right scientists. And so if we're asking questions and we're only studying these, we've been studying European populations for the last 25 years, we don't even actually know what are the topics and phenotypes and things that we should be studying from um, in, in, in different populations. What are, we're talking about, we need these populations to be enrolled in these studies in order to have enough power and people to kind of answer these questions, we have to understand the population, not just from a genetic and science perspective, but from a cultural perspective. And so you do need scientists that represent these communities because we're engaged with the, with the community. We actually, um, especially given the history, are much more trustworthy than some of our white counterparts. And so coming in and, you know, actually having a personal human care and concern for these populations in a way that directly touches you, does impact the questions you ask, does impact the type of community you engage in for that research. And so it's important that we have diverse scientists and you know, populations. It's not, I tell people all the time, you know, a lot of geneticists, you know, three years ago would say, oh, we just need more, we just need more, you know, African descent samples. We just need more Southeast, um, Southeast Asian samples. We need more Latinx samples. It's not just about the samples. You're not going to get the samples if you don't have the trust of the community, if you don't have the community at heart. And so it's, it's a, it's a long, it's a lot of challenges, but there's also a lot of promise because all of this um, all of the challenges that I mentioned to you have all been worked on. And there are a lot of huge initiatives making sure that we have diverse scientists at the front lines asking these questions who are de deeply connected to these communities. We have improvement in the technology. We have improvement in the methods. And, um, you know, we're also improving the, the, the research that has been done before to make sure that it checks before we just decide to prescribe a medication or make a diagnosis, you know? So I think there's a lot that is being done. It's barely scratching the surface. We have a long way to go, but you know, we're getting there. On a kind of personal level, what has it been like for you as an African-American American kind of bringing this important research to the forefront and, and making sure that obviously you said that you work for Illumina and making sure that you'll kind of have that at the forefront there as well? It's been, um, it's been a journey. So I, you know, I often hear people come to me and ask me, can you help me with my diversity and inclusion initiative? How can we get more samples from diverse communities? Can you help us do that? Can you help us do that? And I, I always give a little bit of pushback. It's not because I don't wanna help, but it's because, you know, most of us want to make sure because there's such a long history of distrust, I can't just sign on to everyone who just says they want to have diverse samples. I have to like really, really make sure that whoever I'm working with is doing this for the right reasons. Um, and those reasons can't be, you know, self-motivated. And I ask questions, well, well, how many, you know, how many diverse scientists do you have on your team working on this? And most of the times the answer is zero because they're coming to me, right? <laughs> and then the second question I also have to ask, you know, um, I have a PhD in human genetics. I actually don't have a PhD in diversity and inclusion. There are people who are diversity and inclusion experts. I have a lived experience as a black woman. And so I don't know if I'm even qualified, you know, to be, um, to lead a diversity and inclusion initiative 
from a very professional, you know, implementation standpoint. I have a lived experience, but in no ways am I an expert. I am an expert in genetics, right? And so I also sometimes get a little offended because it's almost a dismissal of my actual science training and my actual science discipline to, well, you look like this. I'm missing this from my research question or my research program. I need it. And I just going to make an assumption that you can get it for me. So I think, you know, in those, I, I always just tell people, you know, be careful how you approach these things, especially a lot of Black scientists who are in academia right now having to do their science, but also do 100 million diversity and inclusion, you know, support help. And it doesn't help them get tenure, right? It's not like someone's giving you a pat on the back and saying, you know, um, thank you. And here's a promotion. A lot of this work is done for free. It comes with a lot of stress. It also comes with, and this is another thing that's kind of really complicated. It comes with a, dealing with a little bit of trauma. I mean, if you could imagine um, thinking about, I have to wake up. I don't get to, I don't get the privilege of waking up one day and not noticing that I'm black or not noticing that I'm a woman. And to be or to be in a position where I would have to talk about those challenges and like all these horrible things that have happened to me or in my community every single day, you can imagine that takes a huge toll on a person. I mean, so much so that before I started doing this work, I never talked about it. I wasn't talking about this at Vanderbilt. Um, I was just kind of assuming that's just the way the world was and no one cared to change it. But now that we are able to talk about it, and now that I can say the word race in a conversation, you know, um, I have to tread a fine line of, okay, this might be informative to the audience, but how is this making me feel to re-victimize myself with the long history of eugenics and racism and all of these things that have built up that really has gotten us in the situation that we're in? And so it is hard, <laughs> it's not easy. Um, so you have to, you know, definitely do self-care um, and definitely reorient. I, I like to think of myself and I think about my ancestors. I'm not the first person working on these things. And um, there are a lot of people who came before me who were working on these things. And I now understand the sacrifice they made so that I could be here to work on these things. And so my outlook on it is that, um, as long as I'm doing the right self-care work on a bigger scale, I'm doing something bigger that will impact the, the generations to come. And so hopefully they won't have to deal with as much trauma as I did, or even more trauma as the people who came before me. Um, so it, it is a challenge. At Illumina though, um, not so much because at Illumina, I've been very fortunate enough to focus on science. Um, at Illumina, I don't do a lot of diversity and inclusion work. Um, you know, being at Illumina, I've been fortunate enough to really been able to have the respect of being a scientist. Um, you know, they're not pinging me, hey, can you come and, you know, be on the DNI initiative? You know, Illumina has been very smart in, in, in hiring staff who are experts in this area, and they've been amazing. Um, at doing this work for Illumina. And so I actually enjoy that because like I said, it would be not so fun to have a job where 40 hours a week you talk about your trauma, right? <laughs> like, I don't think anyone wants that, but I don't think a lot of people realize that that is the experience of someone um, who was who doing this work, so. Aside from, uh, from your work at Illumina, you're also the host and executive producer of a podcast called In Those Genes. Um, what made you kind of like want to start that kind of adventure and what has the journey been like for you um, throughout that as well? You know, it's been just like the journey of getting a PhD. It's been <laughs> um, a lot of imposter syndrome. Like I say, it doesn't go away. It just comes in different forms. So in 2018, I applied for a program called Spotify Sound of Camp, and uh, a friend of mine told me about the program uh, and I was like, ah. I like podcasts, but I don't know what I'm going to have a podcast about. And then I, I went to bed and then the next morning I was like, oh, in those jeans, that's a podcast. And I, the name came to me because it's a, it's a play upon words from an old 90s R&B song from Genuine, but it wasn't, you know, G-E-N-E-S, it was J-E-A-N-S, right? And so um, completely different, <laughs> completely different <laughs> topics, but um, I really uh, 
I really woke up the next day and was like, oh, I can have a podcast and it, we're going to have all these things like the gene of the week and we're going to pick a gene and we're going to change the acronym, acronyms, you know, like the BLM gene is going to stand for Black Lives Matter. And, you know, we're going to do all these cool things. None of that stuff actually came through on the podcast. But, you know, I wrote this application and it was going viral on Black Twitter. And so, so many people were applying to, to, to do this. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to get it because I was just seeing the tweets and 18,000 people applied. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a statistician. Like this is, this is not in my cards, it's fine. And then um, I got a rejection email and I was like, yeah, I wasn't surprised. You know, I don't know if those things happen. I felt a little drop in my heart, felt away for like five minutes and then it was fine. And then I got another email that was like, congratulations, you're in the top 20. And I was like, wait, okay. So then I go into top 20, I interview, I wind up being in the top 10 and the top 10 got to spend a week in New York to learn about podcasting. And then the top 10 competed for three spots to win $10,000 to start their podcast. And I won one of the top three spots and, um, and started in those jeans. And so not long after that, I met um, Sam Riddell, who is our lead producer. At that time, she was working at a, uh, a company called Inverse and they were working on a episode on um, gene editing. And so she was going to interview me for gene editing. And, and I just thought she was so cool. And I was like, hey, do you know any producers who would be interested in working on a podcast called, about genetics? You know, I'm starting this podcast. I don't have anybody. And she's like, I'd be interested. And I was like, oh, OK, let's just like work together for a week and see where it goes. And it was amazing. And it's been amazing ever since. And so we created the first episode um, which is called Scientific Sankofa. We talked about the Sankofa principle here. And it, it really is about me learning about my own identity and uh, with my parents. And so it's a conversation with my parents and just kind of entering, opening up this season on how can we learn about ourselves. And the whole season is on genetic ancestry testing, which um, most people in the Black community in America have strong interest in genetic ancestry testing because of the history being erased. And so we decided that whole season to dive really deep into it. What is everything you should know? Where are the black owned companies? So we do a rap battle, you know, we talk to the elders and ask them what their thoughts are. We're very, you know, we looked at 23 and me and said, Hey, what are you doing with the data? We looked at privacy and we talked with legal experts. We also talked to, you know, genealogist stands who like, you know, look for their 30,000 cousins, right? Like we, we have all of these fun, episodes and one of the things that's been very delightful about in those genes is like I told you talking about this stuff can be somewhat painful and traumatic and we have found this very sweet spot of bringing in black culture which is full of joy and music and, and all these things to make something very heavy a little light but yeah. also educational yeah and what's it been like for you like seeing like the response to this and people's kind of like interaction with it as well it's been very humbling um I was terrified at first <laughs> you know like um I was very terrified because this was I, I tell it was like that coming out you know like everyone in the genetics community I'm sure they knew I was black right but then I uh, but I say it was like my coming out because it was like I think when you work in a space where you're like one of few you have to assimilate to make other people feel comfortable and I really, I really empathize with international scientists who have to work in, in Western culture because they have to, you know, um, if we think about the erasure of East Asian names, right? Just to make it easier for us to pronounce. Like there's so much assimilation that has to happen that you do have a different identity in certain spaces than you do at home. You know, a lot of international scientists will come to work and be a completely different person, speak completely different languages, go by completely different names when they are at home, right? So you don't get a chance to fully be yourself. When I released In Those Genes, I was like, this is really, really me. And the people who have known me as, you know, Janina, the geneticist, are like going to be so surprised when they hear, you know, how authentically black and raw I am and I was like they're gonna hate it all the scientists are gonna they're just gonna hate it they're not they are going to absolutely hate it and so I was very shocked that they didn't hate it <laughs> <laughs> I was very shocked um 
you know, and, 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 and just like, you know, you publish things, you're always shocked that someone's going to find, oh, that was a fact, that fact was wrong, right? This is very, very like, oh my God, everything has to be right. We have to get all the facts right. We can't get it wrong. And I am still like that. I still. I'm like that in these interviews. I'm like, please don't let me speak. <laughs> Yeah, and, and 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 also because like we're talking about science, like this is this is you don't want to get it wrong. You want to get it. You're never going to get it 100 percent right. You want to make sure you have all the caveats. You use all the words. Um, one of the biggest things I've learned in the, in the science space and making sure we have a fact checker. You know, I'm always fact checking and and whatever. But then when we say things, try not to be so definitive because we know science is so dynamic, especially with COVID. Right? What's true today is not going to be true tomorrow. And that's just how science works. And that's a beautiful thing about science, right? And so we have to talk about it that way because a lot of our listeners are not in the science community to understand that, especially when we talk about genetic ancestry and, and people are really surprised to find out that their ancestry changes. Like, oh, 23 and me did an update. Now I'm not Nigerian anymore. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we have to explain that, right? Like, this is how science works. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a great thing because it means that the science is getting better. But you know, we have to explain those things. So I was terrified. I thought everyone was going to hate it. I thought everyone's going to be like, you can't curse and talk about genetics. And I know that is not what people like, but we, you know, we're all about decolonizing the industry. And um, we think about how we talk with our friends. That's the most safe space. We think about a podcast. It's a very intimate space. This is, I'm literally in your ears. It's just me and you, right? And so this is the most, this is, the most personal space that you will have with someone like a journalist. And so we can use that space to be at home, to be with friends. And if you hear a podcast, you know, comedy podcast, podcast about politics, any other discipline, it's safe. Why have we decided that in science you can't do it, right? Well, you can. Um, you can do that. And you can also, you know, quote 25 papers and <laughs> you can do those two things. No, there are no rules, right? And so I've been very, um, very shocked at how welcoming and how helpful and, and just how supportive the science community has been about the podcast. And it's definitely made me want to continue to do it. It's made me want to continue to keep pushing forward. And so I'm very grateful. I think podcasts are such a good platform, especially trying to um, engage with, with the public and kind of communicate science in a fun in a fun manner why has that been so important for you and why is science communication and public engagement in general just so important for science oh my goodness you know COVID is a great example of that right can you think about the world knows what mRNA is that's crazy <laughs> to me. that's crazy to me right the whole entire world knows what mRNA is um you know, we all understand, everyone has a good sense of what immunity is. Like we all have become little immuno, <laughs> immune biologists, immunologists, you know, in the last year, two years, right? Um, it's extremely important. One, because science itself, science as a language has been extremely inaccessible. You know, I tell people the first humans were scientists. They had to be, they had to figure out, okay, if you eat that berry, you know, so-and-so ate that berry last week and they didn't make it, right? Like, <laughs> so we know not to eat that berry. And then so-and-so ate this baby berry and had 10 babies. So we should eat this berry. That literally is science. People are like, that's science. That's a, that is a study right there, right? All right, we're testing something. And so the first humans were scientists. Um, they obviously weren't speaking the language that we speak today. There wasn't, you know, any peer review publication except for so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so didn't die. So you can eat that one. It's safe. Like that was the peer review process, right? And so this has now evolved, but unfortunately, because of colonialization, because of, you know, things like um, systemic racism, the science has also like really shifted and continued to be um, colonial. It, be it became colonized as well. And if we think about the language, most scientific articles globally are written in English. Um, if we think about um, the populations that are being studied, all of this stuff is really biased, right? Journalism is the same way. We're even science journalists, while the language is um, more lay, 
it's still very much so focused on like science enthusiasts, right? It's not focused on um, the average person and it's most definitely not focused on the average person of color. And so I see that as a barrier. Why would we want to keep science? Like science is so cool. Why would you want to keep it from anybody? Like everybody should have access to science. And if access to science means that we change a few words or maybe we use a scenario that's more familiar to you, then fine, that's cool. I mean, there's, why not? More people who are doing science, the more we're going to learn. That's, I mean, that's just it, right? And so I really like am passionate about changing the language and making it more accessible. And that can be done a host of different ways. And why can't we use music? Why can't we have fun? Like there are no rules, right? So we have to change, you know, as we change the culture of science, we now start to bring in more, more scientists. We now start to make it safe for people to come and engage in science and be their authentic self because that's going to do nothing but make the science better. Yeah, and I feel like so much exciting stuff happens in science. And like, I want to talk to my family about it and I'm trying to explain like CRISPR and stuff to them. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but like you, you, you end up doing it and you end up explaining it in ways that make sense to them. And then they're like, they're excited by it and, and things like that. Like it is just, it's so important. But aside from the kind of science communication, you're also um, an activist for, for STEM um, education. Why are kind of STEM subjects just so kind of inaccessible to like to, to many people and how can we ensure that obviously not a lot of people are, may not be interested in STEM in general like some people are good at art and things like that but how can we ensure that it's not a kind of like an access issue that is the problem yeah I mean I think for the same reason um you know we have all these systems and structures that say if you want to do science, you have to be this type of person. But scientists don't have fun. They don't, they are in the lab, they wear glasses, they are <laughs> not doing anything that is cool. And we have to get rid of that. Like we have to really say, like scientists and an artist, they look like the same exact person, you know, they do the same thing. They're just as smart, you know. Um, I think there's this assumption that scientists are these very smart people and that can be true and it can also be true that every other discipline there are very smart people as well you know when people start to um i think one of the biggest issues we do is we create we create we institute more hierarchy so we already have a system of hierarchy with race and gender right and sexuality and all these things and why are we going to take disciplines and start to say, well, medicine and science is above English and medicine and science is above art or above music. And I don't believe in that. I believe in flat. It, we, it, it has to be flat because in every sector of humanhood, we needed artists, we needed musicians, we needed scientists, we needed um, culinary people, we needed engineers, we need everyone equally. There is no one above the other, right? And so if we destigmatize what it means to be a scientist, more young people would be interested in it. And also, like I was saying earlier, if we try not to put it in this, like, okay, we already put it on this high pedestal. And then we, you know, the systems are like, okay, you gotta be really, really smart. So you gotta score within the 0.5 percentile in order to be a scientist, you know, take away those systems. Um, also take away the barriers. So then we have it in this tight little siloed box where we use all this heavy, long words and language, you know, like, you know, why, why are we, we're intentionally trying to make it even harder. So then we exclude people and we continue to exclude and exclude and exclude. And then you don't have as many people that is like diversely representing the world there. And so why? there's no reason why <laughs> we don't need to do this, right? We can make science is just as cool as art. You know, I have cool little, I have, I have these little, these little, I can have cool little funky artsy glasses, you know, <laughs> be a scientist, right? Like you can do all these things and we just have to change the way we think about it because that is just such a beautiful thing, such a beautiful thing. 
And I remember as I was like growing into, when I was at Spelman, you know, a lot of my professors and stuff would teach us, you need to dress this way and you need to be this way. And they were protecting us because they wanted us to be accepted in these academic circles. But we have to change, you know, uh, we have to change the way we, we do things because bringing all this uniqueness and authenticity and individuality, it just makes it even better, you know, it just makes it so dope. So that's, that's, that's my two cents. And we all got to get a pair of those glasses. <laughs> in the <community. laughs> Love them. I mean, outside of your career, we forget about that for a second. What do you kind of like to do in your, in your spare time? What are some of your hobbies? Oh my God. So I'm a big art person. Um, <laughs> I'm in New York right now, which I love New York. I love London too. You know, London has a big art scene too. I was in gifted art when I was in high school. Um, so I actually used to paint, sketch and draw. Um, I don't do as much of that now. I, uh, but yeah, I like to dive into the deep, the, deep into the art. So whether it is, you know, binging, you know, vintage Afrofuturism, low budget movies, you know, independent films. I've, but I've been to Sundance, which I thought was cool. I was probably the only scientist there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a huge music person. Um, so I go to concerts, like just this week alone, I've been to one film festival and one concert and tonight I'm going to an opera, you know? So I, I like to stay pretty engaged with the arts because I think it actually stimulates the sciences. Like these two are so close together. So I'm, I'm really always looking into, you know, music, um, visual art, um, film, it's just such a beautiful thing. Uh, I also love community and mentorship. And so I try to do, uh, I do volunteer work um, right now, or last year we did volunteer work with a nonprofit called Gen Space, where we taught high school scientists how to make a little science podcast. And we call them snippets, you know, because that's funny. Um, <laughs> and um, there were, I think, 12. They're all between 15 and 18 years old. And they made, you know, small little short audio stories on science topics that they were interested in. It was really cool because they talked about climate change and they talked about fast fashion and they talked about CRISPR and they talked about COVID and, um, you know, just teaching them how to use their voice for the things that they're passionate about. And we did that last year. And so I'm, I'm doing it again, volunteering, teaching there and doing that with them, as well as teaching them some human genetics and computational science. So I like to do these things. That's what I do on the weekends. And I am a runner. So I've run two marathons and about 10 half marathons. Um, I won't be running any more marathons, but <laughs> <laughs> I do plan to get back into the half marathon um, running again. But yeah, I haven't been doing much since COVID because all the races have been canceled. They just had the London Marathon. So that actually happened. But um, yeah, I like running and I like the arts. And obviously I like writing the podcast. And I'm also writing a book, which is, is extremely delayed, just like any other academic. So it'll get done when it gets done. But yeah. I mean, you do so much running. Uh, I can't keep up. Well, I, don't, I don't even know what I do on my weekends. <laughs> they just fly by. <laughs> they, they it does become like when I'm binging Netflix I'm like it's rare well first of all I'm also like overstimulated so I have to hide my phone when I ever want to watch tv because I can never get through an episode but yes I try to like I try to keep balance but it's hard and I don't think anyone knows how to do it great so I'm just trying my best but I like to do the things that keep me happy you know yeah this is the kind of ultimate question but if you could turn your career so far into a film or a book what would you call the title? Ooh. You're going to try and make a genetics pun. <laughs> so I, I, I love the, I love the word geneticist. You know, if it was like, if it was like um, my life story, I would call it like, you know, the life of a geneticist or like something like that. In those yeah. genes would be predictable, but I would definitely use that. Um, the first episode of our season two that hasn't been released yet I love the title and the title was how the world inherited blackness. And it, it just talks about the creation of race. It talks about, you know, how this translates into medicine. It talks about how this translates into so many things. And it's a huge genetic component. Um, really all of the titles that we have in the seasons are kind of like this. Scientist, Scientific Sankofa is definitely one. Um, we have another episode called Black to the Future, which is like this space time travel episode. 
you know, I'm so excited about season two, but you know, these are, these are some of the things that we have um, lined up. So any of those would work. I feel like I'm going to think about one that's cooler. I'll email you if it comes, yeah. to, it comes to me. <laughs> I love that. I'm because I always like spend so long trying to think of science puns and then all of a sudden, like it will just spring to my mind. And I'm like, okay, quickly. <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for speaking to me today um Janina I mean it's been so great the work that you do as a scientist as an educator and your podcast is just it's just so great so thank you so much for speaking to me today no problem thank you hello everyone if you enjoyed this video then make sure you check out some of our other videos in our series by subscribing below or going to our website frontlinegenomics.com i hope you enjoy